All right, so today, I'm excited. Today, we're going to take a pause from the body series, um, and we're going to do a two-week series called I Voted. Now, before you get up and leave, <laughs> or before you're tempted to get excited, because there's two people in the church. There's the one who, who cringes every time government and politics is mentioned from the platform, and then there's the person who cringes every time it's not, right? And so the thing is, we're not going to make either one of you happy, okay? <laughs> um, because really our heart for this series, when we talked about the, this concept of doing a series called I Voted, um, what I promise you is it's not going to be a normal election voting type series. What we're not going to do is we're not going to talk policies. We're not going to talk politics. We're not going to talk parties. The, the thing that I was reminded of, even just getting ready for this weekend, is we were eating dinner with some friends and just because the season we're in, we began to, to talk just kind of politics, and we were talking about the debate this past week, and, um, and we weren't even talking about our personal views. We are just talking about the climate. And our, our kids were at the table. We have two kids, our little boy's seven, our little girl's 10. And as we began to talk about politics, um, both of them kind of like begin to do this, and then they look up and they're like, Dad, I don't feel like we should be listening to this. <laughs> And I'm like, what you, yes, you can listen. We're just talking about what's going on. We're just talking about people. And it was such an incredible and kind of gut-wrenching thing of our kids are seven and 10, and they're already feeling this polarizing culture when it comes to talking about this. And when it comes to not knowing how to have a conversation or not have a conversation or how to interact with people. And, and I mean, my daughter's coming home, and everybody's asking everybody, like, who are you voting for? But like, you can't vote. You're 10. Um, nor should you at 10 years old, but they're talking about it. And we talk about it a little in our home, but not a lot. And it just reminded me the importance of why we wanted to do this series. Because again, our heart behind this series is to help people just simply understand how to navigate the season. How to, how to navigate the season we're in as believers. Again, we're not gonna talk about policies. We're not gonna talk about a specific party. We're not gonna encourage you to or how to vote. What we want to do is tackle what we think is the bigger issue. We want to talk about people. We want to talk about people, the hearts of people, yours, mine, those we interact with out in our community. See, what I've realized is in seasons like this where everything is uncertain, where there is no sure, there's no sure deciding thing, there's no uncertainty, there's no even real good confidence as to what's happening later, the only thing we have control over, you know what it is? Is our response to the result. That's it. The only thing that you and I from this point on can control and focus on is how we choose to respond to what's happening and what's going to happen. It's the only thing we can control. And I think it's the most important thing. And so that's really what we want to look at, is what does our response supposed to be? The idea of I voted is that, especially if you are someone who has said yes to Jesus and is walking in a relationship with him, how you respond to people, no matter the result, has already been chosen. You've already voted for how you should respond when you said yes to Jesus, because you said yes to not just insurance, not some just guaranteed thing the day you die. You've said yes to a lifestyle. You've said yes to a different way of living. And so we've said yes to responding differently. Because responses are odd. Because if you never realize it, responses are based on the result of previous experiences. Have you ever realized this? How you respond to something is purely based on what happened to you before. For example, and you can interact with this online too. Has anybody ever like touched a, a, a hot electrical wire and you had a little shock? literally did it last week. Put my hand on two cables that I thought were not live to find out they sure were. Um, when that happens to you, what do you do differently the next time? You're a little more cautious, right? Like that's not a feeling you want to duplicate very often. So you get a little more cautious around electrical wires. Has anybody ever taken a sip of spoiled milk? Yeah. So you learn the principle of smell before you sip pretty quickly, right? It's just right here. Okay, it's good. Like you learn it quickly because you don't want to experience it again, so you get cautious. How about relationships? Anyone ever been hurt, abused, taken advantage of? So what happens? You go into the next relationship a little more cautious, a little more on guard. 
See, depending on what our, our past experiences were, our future responses, we can be tempted to, to make unhealthy ones. We can, to re, we can be tempted to respond with defensiveness and fear and isolation and anger and bitterness. And we can put resentment into a relationship before there's ever anything to resent. All because of what someone else, not that person, but someone else did to us. What I want us to be encouraged of this morning is that there is an experience that we've had that should determine the response we will have. And it's maybe not the experience you're thinking of. In John chapter 13, we see mention of this. As Jesus is talking to his disciples, and this is the evening before he's going to be taken up that hill of Calvary and crucified on the cross. He says this in verse 34 of John 13. He says, so now I am giving you a new commandment which I love that he calls us a new commandment as if anything in the last few thousands of years, they had never told us said this before. So I give you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. See, Jesus is preparing them for the season ahead. And what I love about this is the context of his response and what he says. It's not just a normal day in their life. On this night alone, going into the next day, these 12 men who have been walking with Jesus for the last three years, growing closer to him, closer to each other, on the same night, they're going to see one friend betray him. They're going to see another friend deny him. And then the next day, they're going to see a community who supported them to cry, crucify him. In the midst of this little 24 hour or so period, they're going to see betrayal, denial, and rejection to the point of their friend's death. And in the midst of this context, he says, I need you to remember something love each other. Not in a normal way, but love each other how? How I have loved you. The response we're supposed to give is love. The reason is the experience that we've had with Jesus in which he has loved us. This love that is full of mercy and has no agenda. This love that is given without anything being received in return. He says, I need you to love each other as I have loved you. And the best part of this is that there's not just a response, but he expects a result when we live this way. What does he say? He says, your love for one another will what? It will prove to the world that you are my disciples. See, one of the first choices in our response that we have to make is that we have to choose to reflect something worth running towards. The way that we respond to people, the way that we treat and interact with people should reflect a, something that they want to be a part of. Because it should reflect the love that we've already received from God. It should reflect the love, the grace, the mercy, the compassion, the generosity that we've already received from Jesus. He says, this love will prove that you are mine because it will look different. See, we love wearing things that prove what we are a part of. This is why we, love, we, we wear sports team merchandise. This is why we put little stick figure families on the backs of our cars. I'll never forget, I walked into the store one Sunday and people kept saying, calling me by my first name. And I was like, we have not lived here long enough for us to have this relationship with anyone in this community yet. And I got in the car, bewildered, and I looked down and I realized I still had my church name tag on my shirt. There was something on me that was showing people who I was. In the same way, we are called to live in such a way that there's something in us that shows people who we are. And it should reflect something they should run to. Those, those crosses on the steeple of a church should be a symbol of hope that people run to because they see a safe place, not fear because they might feel judgment. It should be a place of unity and not division, of peace and not pain, of comfort, compassion, hope. Because the way we respond should be a reflection of something worth running to, not running from. The simple filter you can always use is, if this doesn't reflect God, then it's not the right response. 
in the midst of differences and in the midst of dissension and division in our community and in our country, if my response does not point back to the love of Jesus, it's probably not the right response. It's what we're called to. As we go a little further down this path, I want to look at a passage in the book of Romans. Because in Romans, here you have the Apostle Paul, who, what I love about his story is he's been on both sides of this. He's been the person causing division, as he was a man whose sole desire in life was to, to, to end the name of Jesus, to stop the spreading of this hope and good news of Jesus Christ. And then after encountering Jesus, now everything about his life reflected Jesus. And now his desire switched and did a 180, and now everything he did, he wanted to point back to who God was. So when he talks to the church, when he talks to people, he understands both sides. He understands the side of those who you don't agree with and those you do. And so he's talking to the church, helping them understand how, what their response should be to those outside who disagree and those inside the church who they disagree with. His concept and what he teaches is pushing towards our proper response. We find it in Romans chapter 12. We're going to read the first few verses together, Romans 12, 9 through 11. Paul says this, don't just pretend to love, really love them. Like we could just stop there for the rest of our time. We won't because you know me, I like to cram way too much into a Sunday. But that enough alone right there is enough. He says, don't just love them, don't pretend it, actually love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. The second thing that we have to choose as a response is that we have to choose to let love lead the way. We have to choose to let love lead the way. That that has to be the starting response for everything, because this is the most important, the most foundational response that we can have as believers, is to let love be the first thing out the gate. Not something that is earned or gained like a prize, but freely given as Jesus gave to us, to just let love lead. What I love is how Paul kind of sandwiches this one comment in between two commands. Because when we read the first part, don't just pretend to love others, really love them. That's great. No one like, disagrees with that. It's just whether or not we actually do it. And then the next part says, hate what is wrong and hold tightly to what is good. A lot of us get really excited when that is spoken. Because the first thing we think of is the things that are, mean a lot to us. The issues, the policies, the things that we are really passionate about, especially in a season like this. It's like, see, I gotta speak up for what is right. I gotta speak up for what I believe in. I can't be shut down. I can't be censored. I gotta go. Even scripture says it. Hate what's wrong. Hold tight to what's true. I'm holding on to what's true. But what I love is, as true as that statement is, look at where it's placed. Before he ever talks about what you should hold on to and what you should reject. He begins and ends with love. He says, love people genuinely. Don't pretend, love them. Hate what's bad, hold tightly to what's good. Oh, and by the way, love each other with genuine affection. What if, what if the truth, the thing that is good that he's encouraging us to hold tightly to is not a view or a position or a policy? What if it's the response of love? What if that's why that comment is sandwiched in between these two commands? What if what he's encouraging us to hold tightly to is love? To love each other, to hold tightly, to not let anything, any disagreement, any combative discussion, to not let anything separate or pull apart your committed love to one another. What if that's the main thing he's talking about here? What if it's not what you deem is right and it might be what's right? But what if the main thing he's encouraging them to hold tightly to is love? What if the thing he's encouraging them to hate is division, slander, 
gossip, the things that threaten this free love given generously. This perspective is so important because if we leave, lead with love, then love comes freely. If we don't lead with love, then we turn love into some reward that we give when we deem it proper to give it. That is counter to the love that God created. It is counter to the way he loved us and how we were commanded to love each other. You see, love is supposed to captivate people. It's supposed to draw them in. And here's the thing. Love cannot captivate people if you're keeping it captive in your heart. I'll say it again. The love of God cannot captivate. It cannot draw someone in if you are keeping it captive in your heart, refusing to show it unless that person deems themselves worthy based on your view, your principle, your perspective, your choices. That's not the love of God. It doesn't mean you have to agree with them. It doesn't mean that they have to walk in the way salvation is the choice of accepting God's love. It's not, what, it's not just love. The love's there. When we accept it and enter into a relationship with God, that's when we are saved, but the love's already there. It's already given to everyone. It's offered up. It's shown. It's demonstrated. We have to give this freely. We have to give it often. We can't be lazy with love. In Matthew 5, 43 through 48, you can go back and read it later. Jesus is talking about love, and he says, what, 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 how is it special if you only love those who love you? <laughs> he says, what's, so, what's the benefit of that? What's so great about loving those who love you? He says, even the tax collectors, the sinners, those who despise me. He said, even they do that. He says, you want to know what's special? Love those who persecute you and pray for them. Love your enemy. Love those who will never show that love in return to you. Love when it's not easy. Love when it's a little painful. Hold tight to it. Don't let anyone or anything, disagreement, division, party line, separate or pull out of your grip your love for someone else. Let love lead the way in everything you do. The third response is this. If we choose to walk with God, then we choose to see people, not problems. And this is important. We choose to see people, not problems. In Romans 13, I mean 12, 13 and 14, he says that when God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always eager to practice hospitality. 14. And I love these come with each other. Verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Like he doesn't even say just pray for them and then leave it up to you to decide how you're praying. He wants to make sure that your prayer for that person is not God smite them. <laughs> it's not God correct them, God hurt them, God wake them up. No, no. It says just pray that God would bless them. Like let that be how you respond to people. If they're in need, meet the need. If they're being difficult, just love them in the difficulty instead of avoiding it. We have to learn how to see people, not problems. We have to learn how to see people as an opportunity for a relationship, an opportunity to reflect God's love, not a problem we need to solve. They're not a problem, they're a person with a heartbeat that God loves not a problem we solve, nor are they a problem we avoid. They're a person we love. I remember when I was a student pastor, and early on, we, we would have these kids who would be running around our church on Wednesday night, just, you know, just dropping the F word and doing this and saying that, and just, I mean, as, as crazy as you could imagine, you know, there's not a student ministry that's successful that I know that hasn't had drugs sold on property or something bad happen. And I'll remember we had um, some of the, the, the older leaders in our church come up and they're like, listen, you gotta fix this. Like, these kids can't come anymore. And I just remember kind of looking at them. I was like, here's the deal. That's not gonna happen. <laughs> I said, what you are seeing is not a problem. What you're seeing is pain. They speak that way and they act that way because of a pain in their life. There is no better place for them to be than here. 
I will not send them away. I will make them a more comfortable place here. I will not correct them because it's not a matter of what's coming out of their mouths. It's a matter of what's going on in their heart. Let's fix that first, and then the Spirit will do the rest of the work. They're not a problem. This is someone who God has put in our path to love the way that he loved you and I when we were filthy and broken. So the doors are open. The seats are available. Come on in. You can applaud that. Absolutely. This is how Jesus sees them. He doesn't see them as less than. He sees them just as. They're not less than you. They're not less than me. They're just as broken as we once were. And they're just as deserving of God's love. They're just as deserving of mercy and of grace and compassion. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle they sit on. It doesn't matter what policies they believe or what they view. What matters is they are someone who was made in the image and likeness of God. And they are to be loved the way that we have been loved. They are people, not problems. We must see them as that. And then fourth, If we are following this path, then we have already chosen to embrace unity through personal humility. And this one is is one that we have to understand. But we embrace unity through personal humility. Verses 14 through 16, he says this. He says, bless those who persecute you. We're going to go back to this one a lot, all right? Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. I love that he says this. Don't think you know it all. The greatest thing that I've learned during this season, as we sit at home with nothing to distract us uh, against seeing the pain that's going on in our world, the one, the biggest thing that I've learned is this. When we've never personally experienced something, we have a hard time acknowledging that that something is real. When we've never personally experienced a type of hate, it's hard for us to acknowledge that that hate exists. When we haven't experienced a type of judgment against us, it's hard for us to appreciate and understand and even recognize that that judgment actually exists. That's why when you take people I think of bring on the ministry. When people go with you and experience this, I'm sure one of the things you hear a lot is, I never realized it was this bad because they never experienced it. Don't assume that you know everything. Don't assume that you know every way that people are hurting, that you've experienced every way that people are in pain, that you understand or have experienced every viewpoint, every perspective. He says, don't make the mistake of thinking you know it all. When we begin to view problems as only being real if we've experienced them, then we alienate more people than not. And we alienate their problems, their pains, their issues, their struggles. We alienate how we need to love them when we dismiss it as not being true because we haven't experienced it. If we want unity with people, it starts with our personal humility. It starts with us getting before God, going to those who are hurting and say, listen, I don't understand what you're going through, but I see you're in pain and I acknowledge your pain. I don't have to understand what you're going through to love you while you go through it. I don't have to understand every aspect of it, but I can acknowledge it's true because I see you. If we don't pursue this type of unity through humility, we create an us versus them mentality within and outside of the church. And it's no us versus them. There is no one on this earth who was not created in the likeness of image of God. There's just an us. It's the people who are broken. The only difference is those who have found out how to deal with their brokenness and those who haven't. There is no us versus them. Part of the way that we fight this, um, and kind of skipping ahead a little bit, is that we look for those common bonds. There is no one, no one on this planet that you cannot find a common bond with. We're all made in the likeness and image of God. We're all broken from the point of birth in need of a savior. 
start there and build on that. We have to start with humility in order to experience unity because unity can be experienced within disagreement. I know it doesn't look like it and feel like it, but it can. It absolutely can. It's just about what you focus on. See, when we love people where they are, we accept the reality that if I'm wrong and they're right, it's okay, I should still love them. If they're wrong and I'm right, it's okay, I should still love them. The reality is, is again, love is not about right or wrong. It's about people who are alive and breathing who need love. It has nothing to do with who's right and who's wrong about what issue and what policy. It's just about being willing to say, I don't really, it doesn't really matter to me how you vote, if, or you, if you do or don't protest, what you think about this policy, that policy. I don't even care. I don't care if you voted. I'm going to love you. I don't care if you love me back. I'm going to love you. Because I understand that's the need. That's where it starts. And I don't care how different we are. I know the foundation of how we are the same. We're both made in the image and likeness of God. We're both lost and broken and in pain. And we both need love. Let's just start there. But you won't start there unless you start here. Unless you start with that humility that I don't know everything. I love that he says, don't be too good to hang out with ordinary people. I love that it says it like that as if you're not ordinary. <laughs> but the whole purpose of what he's getting at is just be willing to hang out with people who aren't you. <laughs> be willing to hang out and surround yourself with people who don't agree with you, who don't see things the way you see things, who you're not on the same page with every single thought about. Just be willing to. In the midst of their hate or disagreement of you or with you, be willing. Because it leads us to our last thing. And that's that we have to choose to patiently pursue and practice peace. We have to be willing to patiently pursue. And the, word, the reason I say patient is because discovering peace is not about your time. It's about y'all's timing. <laughs> and so it takes longer sometimes. It takes longer to figure it out sometimes depending on the relationships you have and who you're interacting with. It takes longer sometimes depending on what's creating the, 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 the temptation for division. So we have to patiently pursue it, but then we have to practice it. He says this, and we're gonna begin to close. Verses 13 and 14 and 17 and 18. Again, verse 13, we're in it again in 14. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray for them that God will bless them. Verse 17 and 18, never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. The pursuit of peace is not about surrendering your beliefs. Just hear me on that. Pursuing peace with someone is not about you surrendering what you believe in and just, uh, just consuming and choosing what they believe. Again, you don't have to have full agreement to have peace with somebody. The whole thing of pursuing peace, it's about being willing to pursue love more than proving them wrong. That's what peace is all about. Peace is me saying, I don't have to be right in this. I wanna love you. It's not about, I just need to show you, I need to speak more eloquently, you just need to listen to this podcast or watch this video so that you can see what I see. Peace isn't about that. It's not about you surrendering yours or them surrendering theirs. It's just about you choosing to see past it and to love each other, to choose what is common with each other, to choose what you have in common. It's like any marriage. A successful marriage doesn't go into it from the moment you say, I do, and you just start making a list of how you're different. It's choosing to say, I do, and then pursuing things together. Yes, you're different. That's okay. Even in marriage, you don't have to agree on every small little thing. You love each other. You love God. You love your kids. You can make it work. Because you start by pursuing peace. 
Pray for those who persecute you. Pray that God would bless them. I wanna see that on a coffee mug this week. Like we have those Bible verses that we knit on pillows and that we put on coffee mugs. I haven't seen that one. <laughs> like that's not how you usually wanna start your day. You wanna sip out of a mug that says God will bless you today. You wanna sip out of a mug that says God, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you. What you don't wanna see every morning you wake up is, oh, by the way, make sure you pray for that person who despises you today. Make sure you pray for the neighbor who removed your sign out of your lawn. <laughs> Make sure you pray that the person who you just can't seem to get along with, that God would bless them today. It says pursue peace. But again, remember what's your responsibility and what's not. Because peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is seeing the need for conflict as long as it leads to resolution. He says, do what you can do. You're gonna have someone who refuses to live at peace with you. You can't fix that every time. But what we as believers have to choose is that if there is no peace in a relationship, it will never be because we have not extended it. If there is no peace and resolution in a relationship in our life, it must never be because we said, I'm done. Never. Never until the moment that that breath is no longer on earth or nor is yours. Never until that moment when it's impossible because of life do we ever give up on pursuing peace with someone in this world. Never. There is no restriction to it. There is no rail system with it. He says, do everything you can do. You have to leave the decision to them. Can't be on us. We can't be the reason that peace doesn't exist in that relationship. We can't be the reason that peace doesn't exist with our neighbors. We can't be the reason that peace doesn't exist with our kids, with our parents, with our aunts and uncles, the crazy cousin who we didn't even know existed until a couple years ago. Like The reason that peace isn't in that relationship cannot be because of us. It's just do all you can do to pursue peace. This morning, our whole hope with this series is that we would all understand our response. That we would together hate what is wrong, that we would hate division, that we would hate slander, that we would hate this divisive mantra and concepts, but that together we would cling to tightly with every ounce of white knuckle grip we have what is good. That we would hold tightly to love to compassion, to grace, to mercy, to seeing people and not their problems, to pursuing peace, doing all that we can to let love lead the way, that we would find humility so that we could find unity with those around us. This morning as we, we're done, <laughs> um, I just want you to think as we pray Maybe today there's a response that you've been debating how to make. Someone in your life that you've had that disagreement with, you've had that, that brokenness with, and, and maybe today what God is stirring in your heart is that either he's showing you clarity on how to respond to them or he's, he's, he's kind of flicking your heart <laughs> because you did respond, but you didn't respond properly. And what he wants to push you towards today is to go pursue that peace to find the humility to let love lead the way and see the person, not the problem, and to make a call today, to schedule a coffee this week. Not to debate, not to argue, just to open the conversation by saying, I'm sorry. I got mad. I got upset. I let something come between us. I want peace. And we love them without any expectation of that being returned. This morning, I think that's where I want to kind of direct our prayers. Is I think there's some of that in the room. I think there's some of that in our hearts and in our lives. And my prayer is that as we go into the week, that our pursuit is God, show me the response to take. Show me how to fix this response that I made. 
God, lead the way with love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that you are a God who has demonstrated a love that we would not know without you. Father, I ask and pray that as we continue to walk through the season that we would just look for the commons. We would start by looking at and being reminded that everyone that we are battling with, everyone we're disagreeing with, it's not about party lines, it's not about policies and perspectives and views and experiences. That, that's all a sidestep and a side note. The thing that we have in common, the thing that deems us all being worthy of loving each other in a way that is uncommon, of praying for each other in a way that is uncommon, is that we are all made in your likeness and image. We are all broken. We are all just as in need of your love. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity and the ability that we have to love people, that we don't have to choose division, that we don't have to choose separation, but that we can choose Unity, love, compassion, mercy, and grace because it lives in us. Father, stir our hearts for those corrections we need to make this week. Lead us in the responses we will have this week, no matter the results. Father, we love you. It's in your sins name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us today. And if our ministry has been a source of encouragement for you, let me encourage you to do two things. Number one, share it with a friend who needs hope. That would make a big difference in their life. Secondly, share it with us. We would love to hear your story. You can send us an email at amen at bridgechurchfl.com. And finally, if you'd like to partner with us financially as we bring hope both locally and around the world, you can do that directly through our website, bridgechurchfl.com forward slash give. And thank you for letting us be a part of your spiritual journey.